Hi, welcome to n tv I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Janet Thurgood, and she's going to tell us about her near-death experience. Hi, Janet. Hi, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, so thanks. I guess I'll start at the beginning, which is when I was really little. Uh, I've always been really super sensitive to spiritual things, and I think that that was kind of the beginning point for my spiritual journey. Um <clears throat> <clears throat> but I had a lot of health problems in my life and that was the catalyst for me having this experience. And um, so I went through 25 years of Lyme's disease, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, you name it. I dealt with a lot of pain and um, brain fog, um, lots of fatigue, lots of really, ju just a lot of struggle in my life. And on top of that, I had six children. I was running a full-time cleaning company out of my home. So I was on this adrenaline cortisol high for a long, long, long time, trying to just brute force my way through life. I mean, I wanted to live life the way everybody else was living it. And I just thought everybody else was brute forcing their way through their days and their experiences as well. But it got to a point where I said to my husband one night, I feel like every time I wake up in the morning, I'm in more of a deficit than when I went to bed the night before. Like I'm more tired when I get up in the morning and I feel like I'm going to reach a point where I'm just too tired to even wake up, that I'm I'm just going to not wake up. And that scared him. And, um, and it's kind of scared me that I was in that place. Um, it wasn't all bad. I would have highs and lows, like I would have good times and bad times. And in the good times, I would push my way through life some more. And, uh, and in the bad times I would go to bed, but, um, there came a point in time where I, I really did reach a breaking point. I was on this cortisol high for so long and I was really pushing myself through a lot of stress, unnecessary stress, homeschooling all my kids. I was running a full-time company out of my home. I had 10 employees. I was, um, involved, really busy in my church community and and that culture, and doing a lot of service service work there, and and running a household. I had six children, and um, so it was a lot of stress. And at one point, I said that was when I said to my husband, "I am so burnt out. I'm so tired, and I feel like I'm dying." So we put the kids back in school. Um, I sold my cleaning company. We ended up moving. Uh, I ended up moving out of that church community. So I wasn't serving in that area as much anymore. And I found myself sitting on my sofa, nursing a new baby, just staring out the window going, I don't know what to do with myself anymore. So I decided, you know what, this is a time for me to in really invest in self-care. And so I, I really honestly put a lot of attention and resources into trying to figure out how to become whole, how to get healthy. And um, I started changing my diet. I started doing all the things and researching. <clears throat> and um, I wanted to exercise. I thought that was a good way for me to take good care of my body. But I did. I was not aware at that time that my body was nowhere near ready for exercise. Um, but I, I got about a month into that regimen of um, working out. I worked out with a group of women from my church. And um, they were doing these workouts at the park every single day. So I would plug in and go. But uh, there was one particular day about a month into that, that I just was not feeling on my A game. I wasn't feeling super great. I was tired. Um, but I thought, you know what? No pain, no gain. I'm going to push through this like I always do. I'm just going to brute force my way through this. And um, I'm going to get a good workout in. But that was not a good idea. I did not know that my body was screaming at me and I wasn't listening to my body, um, basically telling me you need rest, you need rest. Um, but I pushed through the workout and about midway through that workout, I started feeling really dizzy and lightheaded. And, and I just thought I do not feel good. So I went off from the rest of the group and I sat on this little park bench and I just thought, I'm going to get my bearings. I'm going to take a drink of water, but almost immediately, um, like I collapsed and I could feel my body shutting down. I could feel my extremities losing vitality. My arms started to curl in towards my body and they went hard as a rock. My legs stiffened up. Um, 
So my body's obviously going into shock, trying to preserve the vital organs. And then my vision went. And after my vision went, my breathing started to shut down. And I, I was panicking a little bit. I remember one of the last thoughts that went through my conscious brain was, I'm going to die here. Uh, because I could feel it. I could feel myself leaving, being sucked right out of the body. I knew that feeling very well because I had spent 25 years of my life dealing with autoimmune. And in those laying in bed moments, I would literally kind of come and go, be sucked out of the body and then back in and then sucked out and back in. And that feeling was familiar to me. But I, um, in that moment, as I was panicking, to catch my breath, the panic literally flipped almost within an instant. It flipped from panic over into peace. And all of a sudden, the last thing from my mind was worrying about getting a breath. I, I just didn't even worry about it anymore. And I, <clears throat> I could feel myself moving towards that piece. I wanted more of it because I was drinking it in deeply and it felt so amazing. Um, I felt overwhelming surges of love flowing through my entire being and I wanted more. And so I started to move in that direction. And as I did, I separated out of my body and I was still very conscious. So it wasn't like I fainted because I was still very conscious about everything. Like I was keenly aware of every minute detail that was going on around me. I could hear women crying and panicking and stressing out and calling 911. Um, I could hear those things and perceive those things and was very much dialed in to what was going on. And I also remember thinking to myself, why are they acting like that? because it didn't make any sense. I was not having the same experience that they were. Um, I was in this beautiful, blissful, wonderful um, place of love where I just felt like I was being held by the hands of God in this beautiful space. And it was so easy and it was so effortless and it was so, um, I don't even, I don't even know if there's words to describe how, amazing and euphoric that experience was. And it didn't last very long. I didn't go to heaven and I didn't talk to angels at that point in time. Um, but it did open up um, opportunities for me to do that later on. Um, and we can talk about that. But in this particular moment, I just briefly popped out, got some perspective, and then was told to go back into that physical body that was so filled with riddled with pain and fatigue and fog. And, and I didn't want to go back into the body, but I did feel like I was supposed to. Um, but as I was separated from the physical body, at some point I could see, and I was aware that I was seeing this with my spiritual eyes and not my physical body, but I could see the whole scene. I could see, um, the ambulance coming from far away. I could see the women freaking out and on their phones. I could see the woman that was cradling my head in her hand, slapping my face, trying to get me to revive. And she was saying things like, come on, Janet, you got to breathe, come back. And, and I remember the thoughts or the feelings uh, in me at that time was, I don't want to <laughs> like, this is way better. You know, it was the first time that I had really been liberated from a physical body that was so broken and so um, heavy and dense and dark and struggling. Um, I just felt so free and so liberated and so awake and so aware um, and so present, all the things. So, but while I was in that state of awareness, there were three things that I felt um, came to me in that uh, in that moment that I will never forget. And the first thing that came to me, the realization was I am not that physical body. I remember looking back at that physical body. And as I looked over the scene, it's a weird feeling to see the familiarity of your physical body and think, oh, wow, I thought that was me. You know, I'm looking at this body. It, 
it, but as I'm looking at it, it just seems like it's this inanimate, lifeless bag of earth and water that uh, obviously the elements of the earth have intelligence to them, but not consciousness. I was that consciousness that was animating that body. And now I was not animating the body. And so that was the first realization that I think I made in that moment was I am not the physical body. Um, In fact, how I see the body now is, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you put on clothing, you put on an outfit that represents how you feel for the day or your personality or what you're going to go out and experience for the day, that outfit represents our physical bodies, but it is not the sum total of who you are. So when you're clothed in a mortal body made of material, that material is just an activity that's happening with earth and water that is being animated by your consciousness but it's not who you really are. And I think, you know, that was a big epiphany for me because I was so invested in the persona of Janet. You know, I was so invested in the persona of my hair and my body and my makeup and how I look and um, how I move about in, in the world. But I didn't realize that that isn't me. (laughs) So I was investing a lot more time into that persona than I, than I really, than was healthy, I think. And so that was the first epiphany that came to me is I'm not that body. The second epiphany that I think came to me was death isn't real. Death is a doorway. Death is a corridor into another experience, another dimension, um, another place, um, another awareness, I guess. And um, what I learned in that moment was we don't cease to exist just because we lay down a physical mortal body. And that was such a huge comfort to me because I've lost loved ones. I'm sure you've lost loved ones, Peggy, you know, and, and we often think that death is this finality of the existence of someone. And what I discovered in my personal experience was that I wasn't final. I didn't cease to exist. I was very much aware of everything that was going on around me, even though I looked dead, (laughs) right? And my lips were blue and they couldn't get a pulse and they called 911 to come and revive my lifeless body. So I know that for a time, whether I was dead or not, I know that I hovered in the threshold between this 3D dense world and the spirit world. I know that I hovered somewhere in that corridor, right? Um, But what I learned through experience in there is that there are aspects of us, there are parts of us that are deep within this physical body that are animating this body that are infinite and eternal and never ending. And so the beauty of that was the realization that nothing can harm this persona, this part of me that is um, infinite and eternal. I can't run out of time. I can't really die because I just proved that, you know, even though the body's not doing anything, I'm still here. I'm still very conscious. In fact, I was more aware, more clear, more conscious than I've ever been in my mortal life before. And that was a beautiful and amazing epiphany to have because I I learned from that moment that I get to build an identity for myself based on that and not based on just the cloak that I'm wearing in the physical body, in the physical form, if that makes sense. So if we're building an identity for ourselves based on just the physical body, you're going to have a lot of suffering because that physical body isn't necessarily infinite in the way that your, your spirit self is or your soul is. And so when you can learn how to tap into your soul and create the identity from that place, you can't run out of time. You cannot die. No one can take anything from you because you are everything and you can't lose anything because again, you are everything. So when you start to identify yourself with that part 
of yourself, that infinite part, nothing can threaten you. Nothing can threaten the divine I am. There is no threat to the infinite. What could possibly threaten infinity? Nothing. And so that was a game changer and a life changer for me, that one epiphany. So that was epiphany number two. The first one was, I'm not the body. The second one was, I am a divine I am presence and divine essence that is eternal. The third epiphany that I had was, um, you know, when I, when I had that brief glimpse or that brief moment of looking at the inanimate physical body laying on the ground, I thought to myself, if that's not me, who is this? Who am I? What am I? And when I asked that question, I stepped into the oneness. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But I stepped into this realization that my essence, my energy, my light, whatever you want to call it, my soul, my presence, my essence, my, my spirit, um, it pushed out in every direction. Like the minute that I asked, who am I? My aura pushed out and I became everything. It was almost like, you know, where does my light end and God's light begin? It doesn't. It's like asking, where does the air in the kitchen end and the air in the living room begin? They're, they're integral, they're integrated. And when I stepped into the oneness, I realized and recognized that I am one with every blade of grass. My consciousness, my presence, my essence, my energy is one with every mountaintop, every ocean floor, every grain of sand, and every star in the sky. I literally, in that moment, my, um, my I am, my identity, became one with everything in the universe. I literally became the container of the universe. And now that realization, that is an exercise that I take all of my students through on a regular basis to help them to tap into their oneness. Because guess what? The number one question I get asked from people when I share my story is, I want to be special. I want to have a near-death out-of-body experience. I want to travel the cosmos and talk to angels and speak with God and have these amazing cosmic epiphanies. Well, guess what? You can. And you don't have to die to do it. You just have to become aware. You have to use tools to become aware that you are already one with all of those things. And you can have that conscious awareness experience of being one with everything within the container of the universe. And why is that important? I think it's important because of something that a recent client once said to me when I take them through these experience as a quantum healer, as I take people through these meditative experiences where they get to go within and tap into their higher divine I am within, uh, usually I'll ask them questions like, who do you get to be now? And most people will say, oh, I get to be me. Like without all the filters, without all the personas, without all the expectations, without all the social programming and all of that stuff, I get to be me true and pure and authentic. Well, this man didn't say that. He said, I get to be everyone. I get to be everything. And I loved that because that was the, that was the essence of the experience that I was having in that brief moment where I popped out of the body, recognized who I really am, stepped into the oneness and was one with everything and everyone. And when you can have that perspective with you on a long-term basis and live your life from that perspective, you start treating other humans very differently when you recognize that they are you and that you are them. You start treating blades of grass and trees and nature and the air and the water and the fish and the, the, the animals and the birds you start treating everything in your conscious space very differently when it is you, when it's one with you. And so those were the three major epiphanies that I feel like I got from just separating out of the body for a brief moment. So, and that was also a catalyst for, for 
driving me deeper into the, into the study of quantum healing. So I hired um, a mentor, a coach to help me discover how to access that oneness, access that inner part of myself again and again and again. And the interesting thing about it is that you don't have to pop out of the body to get there. You can get there by going deep into your body. And so that now that's what I do for a living is I teach people how to access the uncharted waters of who they really are for healing, for spiritual awakening, for personal transformation, and um, and and to to really find out who they really are on a deeper level, on a spiritual level. So I teach classes in spiritual sovereignty and um, also quantum healing. Yeah, that's my story. What does that mean? <laughs> spiritual sovereignty. What is that? Oh uh, my gosh. So if you go to my YouTube channel, we've been talking about spiritual sovereignty and autonomy all year this year. And, and what that means is recognizing that you are a divine soul. You are a divine I am, and you don't need anything outside of you to make you feel whole. It's self-aware, self-governed, and um and self-fulfilled and it is from that place that spiritually sovereign place meaning no one gets to control you no one gets to own you no one gets to tell you who you are um you just be you just tap into the beingness of who you've always been that's sovereign right and no other human no other um idol or anything outside of you in the physical mortal realm can complete you and make you feel whole. That's sovereignty, spiritual sovereignty. So I help people tap into that um, for, for growth and for awakening. You know, the whole point, the whole purpose, why God is giving these near-death, out-of-body experiences to people is to help wake us up, to help crack us open. And so it's not about dying. It's about opening and expanding our consciousness. That's what it's about. And so, yes, you can have an NDE or a, you know, a, a heightened spiritual experience every day um, just by learning the tools for how to tap in to you. So what happened when you came back? <laughs> what happened when I came back was I went through the dark night of the soul because I had to reinsert myself back into a physical body that was still hurting. And it was still not very healthy. And um, but the beauty of that was that that then became the catalyst for me to want to explore those feelings again, that expanded consciousness again and again and again. And I had been following some people online already at that point because I was looking for answers. And so um, I hired my first mentor uh, who taught me quantum the quantum healing tools and techniques. And I said to my mentor, I said, Joshua, this is exactly what you're taking me through. And what you're teaching me is exactly what I experienced when I stepped away from the body, when I had my NDEs. And, um, and he said, that's because you're accessing the deepest levels of your being. That's where you are when you're in the body and you're anim animating the body. You're not outside of the body, you're inside of the body. But the beauty of having an NDE is it helps to turn off the distraction of you thinking that you are this body. It helps to take you out of here, out of your brain, out of the ego, out of the persona that you've been conditioned to believe that you are. And with none of that to distract you anymore, you, you literally do stare at yourself and become deeply aware of your beingness. So I was, I didn't realize this at the time, but when I was in the thick of pushing my way through stress and chaos in my life, um, what I was doing was identifying with my persona. And I think that I, I literally did believe that maybe if I do enough, someday I can be enough. <laughs> someday I can matter. I was looking for validation. 
because I didn't have any self-love. Maybe not any, but I didn't have much self-love. So if you don't have self-love or self-awareness, you're going to identify with the ego, with the persona, with the conditioning of the world, and you're going to live a life that's full of chaos and adrenaline and cortisol. And that's what I did. It seems like um, living your life through ego is just like living a life with low IQ. That's what it seems like. It's just not wise. (laughs) You're going to make so many mistakes. You're going to mess so much up. So Yes, but you know what? We're here to do that. We, we're supposed to have these experiences so that we can learn the contrast, so that we can experience the ego, so that we can experience this dense, low vibrational world that is riddled with deception and fear and programming, right, through our emotions and by putting beliefs into us to get us to fear even more. We came here to have those experiences for sure, but um, we can leverage those experiences for our spiritual ascension. And I think that's the point of life is leveraging that stuff so that we can grow, so that we can ascend, so that we can become the like the ascended masters that we that we look up to. How did you go about building this business? So after your NDE, you decided, you know, I'm going to look into this further. And then it ended up becoming a business. Yeah. Well, um, I, it's what healed my body. So I, once I developed the skills, the skill set and started practicing those skills and those tools for tapping into my higher self, um, I, I just felt like, you know what, this, this needs to be, this needs to be learned people need to know that they're a lot more powerful than they've been led to believe that your body, when your body feels like it's broken down or breaking down, your body's just trying to get your attention. It's trying to tell you that, Hey, you put some data here on your hard drive on this physical mortal cloak that you're wearing. And um, this is a reminder, this symptom or this physical problem is a reminder to return it to love. And so how do you do that? By tapping into your higher self because you are love. So that's how I, that's how I was able to pull out of five different autoimmune illnesses and chronic fatigue and pain and anxiety, depression. Um, I don't have to live that way anymore because I, I learned how to tap into the deeper levels of me. So I'm going to share with you six phases that I feel um, are, are pretty similar across the board with most people having these spiritual epiphanies or these spiritual awakenings or these near-death experiences. So the first phase that I feel like I personally went through was the lost phase. <laughs> and that's the phase where um, you're brute forcing your way through life. You can't figure out who you really are. You don't know who you really are. You're up in your head all the time, trying to figure things out, trying to um, build an identity for yourself based on all the doing, right? That's the lost phase. The second phase is the trauma phase. So when your soul bumps up against that resistance enough times, like I said to my husband, I feel like I'm just, I'm just sinking down into a deeper and deeper deficit. Like I'm not going to have enough energy to wake up some morning. I was going from lost phase and entering into trauma phase. And during that trauma phase, what it is, it's like a jolt that's there to wake us up and to get our attention and to crack us open and to um, pull away from the physical realm a little bit, pull away from the physical distraction of the body and the brain so that you can get clarity so that you can get perspective, so that you can have an aha moment and go, oh, wow, there's more than just this physical material world. In fact, there's not only more than just this physical material world, what's going on in that spirit dimension is a lot more important than what's going on in this physical dimension. So that trauma phase is the jolt phase to crack us open and wake us up. The third phase is the collapse So that's what happened to me was my body was like, Hey, I can't do this anymore. 
you're trying to do too much. You're trying to be too much. You're, you're seeking for all the validation in all the wrong places. And I can't keep this game up anymore. So my body went boom and collapsed and crashed. That's the surrender phase. That's where you're either, you either choose to surrender or you're forced to surrender. And almost every human being will go through these phases of spiritual awakening. The fourth phase is the travel phase or the expanded consciousness phase. Some people call it astral travel. I just call it expanded consciousness. So I literally traveled the cosmos in one brief second by gaining the awareness that I have the conscious perspective of every blade of grass, every grain of sand, every star in the sky, and every ocean floor. I have that conscious awareness, and I can live consciously through all the thing, all those things by stepping into the oneness. So that is the travel phase. Um, the fifth phase is the return and report phase. So for me, the return and report was, hey, get back into that body. And it wasn't, you know, I knew that I had a choice. I knew that my free will was navigating whether I could keep going down that path of being separate from my body or entering back into the body. I knew that the good choice for me or the right choice for me was to enter back into the body. So my free will navigated me back in. And wherever my free will and my attention went, that's where my spirit went. Um, so that was the return and report. I went back into the body and I just started telling everybody who would listen about my experience. It was life-changing for me. I came back into my body, um, got back from the hospital. I laid in bed for about a month <laughs> trying to recover from that because it is so exhausting to be out of your body and then to come back in. And, but as I was laying in my bed, I was talking to people on the phone. I was telling my kids, I was trying to tell whoever would listen that I literally felt like God had put a new set of glasses, a new lens on my perspective. Like it shifted my perspective infinitely, eternally. I will not ever be the same because of it. Um, it's almost like I see the world through a totally different lens. And so my return and report phase was, I got to tell people about this. I've got, and so not just telling people about my experience, but telling people how they too can tap into their higher self and be cracked open and have an NDE like experience for spiritual ascension and awakening and to explore those parts of themselves. So that is my return and report. The sixth phase and the last phase that I came up with for me was the restoration and integration phase. So once I had had the experience of being able to step into and tap into my higher self, I realized that it is that self, not my brain self, not my ego self. Because if I were to ask my brain today, hey, how do I heal this physical body? Like I have an injury on my finger right here. And if I were to ask my brain, hey, how do I heal this wound on my finger? Your brain would sit there for days going, uh, I don't know right? But if you asked your higher intelligence, hey, how do I heal this wound on my finger? The higher intelligence would tell you, already on it. I'm already doing it. Just get out of the way. You think right? it's important to so ask? So that's the restoration. Go ahead. Do you think it's important to ask? Yes. I do think it's vital to ask ask your higher self questions. Yes. And that is what I teach now is um, it, it it's vital for our growth and progression and ascension. If we want to ascend and rise out of this prison world that we're in, because we are in a prison. We are. You think about all the systems that are on this planet. They're prison systems. If we want to rise out of those prison systems, the slavery system that we're in, and and it's everywhere. It's in all the different systems of government and work and education and religion and all the things, right? If we want to rise up and out of that, there has to be a high level of self-awareness and self-love. 
So as you gain self-awareness, you start asking your heart the higher questions, the more important questions, your heart will guide you. Your higher self will guide you. And as you start learning how to discern and listen to that inner still small voice that is you, you recognize that that inner still small voice is also connected to the voice of God, to the mind and the will of God. So if you want to know the mind and will of God, you, you got to know yourself. So that is phase number six is the integration, the restoration phase, really learning to stay tapped into your higher self on an ongoing basis and developing a true identity for yourself out of that and integrating that into how you navigate through your life, not from here, but from here, from the soul self, because your soul self knows how you got sick, how to heal the body, how to get to where you're going and where you're going. Your higher self has all of those answers because that part of you is one with the divine, with God. You think that so those are the six phases is more of like a moral self, you know, a, um, a better behaved self, a more in control self, a more selfless self. Because when I we say self, so. you know, it, it can mean a lot of things. Yeah. So. Well, you know, in culture, in religion, in family programming, in education, in all of those different systems that we have here in the 3D world, we make up a, a list of all these rules that are supposed to pertain to everybody, right? That's not necessarily God's morality. That's man's morality. And that's fine if you want to plug into the, the rules of man's system. That's fine because that allows you to, to fit into the systems and into the cultures. But at the end of the day, I think it's more important to be true to God's morality and what God's telling you to do and where God is guiding you. And that is primarily discerned through your higher self, through your heart going in the direction of where your heart is leading you and not necessarily where the rules of the world are leading you. I For example, because, um, my husband and I, you know, we're in our sixties uh, now and we're talking like our grandparents did where we say this younger generation, this, and what's the world coming to and, you know, all those kind of things based on the morality that we grew up with. But yet we recall our grandparents saying the same thing based on the morality they grew up with. And what it, we have as grandparents is looking at the world as if they're losing morality. Um, you know, there's so much theft. There's so much deceit. There's so much drugs. There's so much whatever that we look at through a lens of our own morality and which might not be your neighbor's morality. But yet that it comes to down to like, whose morality are we talking about? You can say God's morality, but I might say God's morality is this. And you might say God's morality is that. And I'm not trying to confuse the issue. It's just, um, you know, what you're talking about is just opening up some questions as I yeah. go. And, and so my question to that would be who decides? Who, who decides what morality looks like for you? And my answer to that question would be that's between you and God. And nobody gets to decide for you, hey, you're doing it wrong because you didn't go to college and you didn't get an education and you didn't go down this particular path. You're doing it wrong, <clears throat> right? Or because you unplugged from, um, you know, a, a, a cultural, I guess, set of programs. Um, who's, who's to say that you're doing it wrong? Well, ultimately, you know, to go on a basic level, it comes down to what the law says. Because, you know, we'll explain to somebody, this is wrong, blah, blah, blah. Like, okay, we'll see what the law says when you get caught doing this and this, right? I yeah. mean, yeah, right. And that's all, that all comes down wrong. to free You can will. say you didn't hurt anybody. You can argue till the cows come home. But when the law catches up with you, yeah. there's going to be consequences. Well, yeah, I, I, I do believe in order for sure. I, I do believe in order. I mean, I think that within the kingdom of God, as long as you are honoring someone else's free will and you're standing in a place of pure love and charity, which is the highest levels of love, 
um, and you're fixed on God's glory, which is the highest will for you and others, you can make whatever choices you want to within those parameters. But there are parameters for sure. You don't take someone else's life. You don't, you know, right. and, and so if you want to know what God's morality is, you have to know yourself. I guess that's the big takeaway is most people in the world don't know who they are. They really don't. They don't know how to access God's morality because you're right. There is a lot of deception. Yeah. And I see that a lot when people are pointing at everybody else. They don't know who they are because they're like, they're doing this. They're doing that. I don't like this. And they're pointing, pointing, pointing. I'm like, where do they ever turn that high powered finger over to themselves? Yeah. Yeah. What brings order to a, to a civilization is love. Now, love did you is the common book? denominator. Pardon? Do you have a book? No, I'm in the process of writing one. I need to get it done. <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, I, I, I'm in that in the process of getting that. Okay. Do you have a website? You have a YouTube channel, right? I do have a YouTube channel. It's called greater life, greater impact. Um, I do have a website and it's just Janet, J A N E T Thurgood, T H U R good.com. Okay. And if you go to my website, um, you can sign up for my classes. I do free weekly classes every Tuesday where we talk about spiritual sovereignty and you can jump on those classes live or you can just catch them over on my, on my um, YouTube channel. Okay. Was there anything else you wanted to add? I think that's it. Thanks for okay. the opportunity. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Good luck with those six kids. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. They're all grown now. Yeah. We uh, had 14, most of them adopted. So yeah, they're all grown. I always go, thank God. <laughs> wow. That's impressive. Good for you. That's a lot of work. Yeah. All right. Thanks, you. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy.